All right, now we can start almost anywhere here, but let's start in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. 1 Thessalonians 2, 13. If you can't turn to the uh, pastures in time, write them down and look them up on your own, because we're going to go. We're going to move. 1 Thessalonians 2, 13. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. If you're saved, this book will work in you. It'll only work effectually in you if you believe it. If you don't believe it, it won't work in you. The Bible said, when you heard it, you receive it not as the word of men, but as the word of God, and it effectually works on a man that believes. Take your Bible and turn to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Hebrews 4, verse 12, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. I don't discern its thoughts and intents, it discerns mine. That book is perfectly capable of judging any college professor in this town. Now that book is perfectly capable of taking apart and critiquing and dissecting anything you ever heard, anything you ever read, anything you ever learned. Verse 13, neither is there any creature, that takes care of you and your mother and your professor. <laughs> neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. His sight? Well, who's the him? Verse 12, the word of God. He talked about that word like it was a person. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, the word of God. You say, well, it's Christ. No, you're wrong. When he said the word of God is quick and powerful and sharp than any two-edged sword, it's not referring to Jesus, because when Jesus comes back in Revelation chapter 19, he opens his mouth and a sharp two-edged sword goes out of his mouth. It's not the incarnate word, it's the written word. Amen. The word of God is quick and powerful and nothing is hid from his sight. This book has personality, it's like a person. But I said you got a paper poop, fellow told me one time. <laughs> Amen. Amen. That's all right. At least I got one that's infallible and sinless. That's more than you got. You know, one time a fellow found a fanatic out there in the streets of New York running around a half, you know, he's pointing at the half in the middle of the road and saying, it's alive, it's alive, it's alive, it's alive. And a whole bunch of crowd gathered around there thought he was nuts. And he kept running around the half saying, it's alive, it's alive. And they kept saying, what's alive, what's alive? And he went over and picked up that hat and there was a Bible underneath it. And he said, the word of God walked on up. And folks say, well, he's crazy. Well, not as crazy as you are if you don't believe it. Thirteen, neither is there any creature that is not manifest in their sight. You said, I don't like the way you talk. You'll like it less before we get through. Thirteen, neither is there any creature that is not manifest in their sight. Watch it. But all things are naked and open under the eyes of him. Where's the antecedent? The antecedent is in verse 12, the word of God. Make it an open of the eyes of him with whom we have to do. One time the man said to Martin Luther, he said, uh, where is your religion found? And Luther said, well, yours has never been found and never will be found. And the man said, where? And Luther said, in the Bible, nowhere else. One time a man said to John Wesley, where was your religion before the Reformation? And he said, where was your face before you washed it? <laughs> Behind the dirt. <laughs> All right, now let's turn to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. Now Paul's what's called a bibliologer, and that's what scares these college professors so bad. And your Greek and Hebrew professor is scared to death. Somebody would think that they worship the Bible, so they try to make their student worship them. And instead of putting the Bible as the final authority, they corrected the Bible and made you think they were the final authority. All right, now I'm going to show you what the greatest Christian said about this book. Bibliology never bothered him a bit. Galatians chapter 3, verse 7. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same of the children of Abraham. Watch it. And the scripture foreseeing. The scripture foreseeing. Why a book can't foresee. To foresee is something is attribute of something that's living. The scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith preached before the gospel of Abraham, why there were no scriptures when God spoke to Abraham. Did you read back there in Genesis when the Lord spoke to Abraham? Genesis hadn't been written at the time God spoke to Abraham. 
Moses wrote Genesis about 1500 B.C. Abraham lived back there around 1900 B.C. What do you mean the scripture preached Abraham? Abraham had no scripture. You know who it was that said to Abraham, In thee shall all nations be blessed? Who said that to him? Why, God said that to him. Paul, aren't you ashamed of yourself putting the word of scripture for God? My, my, Romans 9. Romans 9. That's what scares people, see. They say you worship that book. Well, I don't have you misunderstand me. I'm not, uh, I'm not a fanatic on it. I know you can burn this book and you can't burn God. I know God is a spirit. Maybe it worship my spirit and truth. I know you can put ink all over this book and you can't put ink on God. I've got some sense. I mean, I'm not making an idol out of it. But boy, it sure do get close, don't it? It sure do get close. Have you ever wondered, somebody said, well, what he's talking about there is the originals. Who told you that? You never read that in the Bible. Where did you ever read in the Bible where somebody said the original said, the original said? Isn't it strange how non-Christian some Christians talk? Here's a man standing up and saying a better translation should be. You didn't learn that from God, and you didn't read it in there. You stand up there and say, it's unfortunate it is this way, and a better writing should be such. Did Paul ever talk like that? Did James ever talk like that? Did John ever talk like that? Did Matthew ever talk like that? Did Mark ever talk like that? Did Luke ever talk like that? Did Moses ever talk like that? Did David ever talk like that? Did Jesus Christ ever talk like that? Then why do you listen to him? You know what I think? I think way down somewhere in that veneer, you've got, you've got a kind of a desire to kind of judge that Bible yourself and be superior to it. And that kind of stuff appeals to you. Now, the guy gets up there, begin to correct it, begin to correct it. You say, well, I can do that. I can study. I can get the brain through that. And then I'll be the final judge. See? You never heard a Christian in the New Testament in your life talk that way and say, the original said, the original said. All right, Romans chapter 9. We just got a good start. Romans 9, 17. Romans 9, 17. For the scripture saith to Pharaoh, Even for the same purpose have I raised thee up? The scripture said to Pharaoh. Why, in the book of Exodus, there were no scriptures around when, when Moses talked with Pharaoh. Moses wrote the book of Exodus years after those events took place, at least shortly after that. The scripture didn't say it to Pharaoh. Who said to Pharaoh, For this purpose have I raised thee up? that I might show my power in thee. Who said that? Why, the Lord said it. Paul's kind of careless, isn't he? The idea of putting the word scripture for the word God, isn't that kind of careless? Must have been a bibliolater. You know, one of my young men I teach over there went downtown one time, got drunk with a fellow from another school, and this fellow said to one of my young men, he said, you're a Ruckmanite. He said, you're following a man. He said, who am I following? He said, you're following Ruckman. And this kid said, I'm not following Ruckman, I'm following this book. I believe this book doesn't have a mistake in it. Another kid said, well, I, I believe it has a mistake in it. And my kid said, who taught you that? Yeah. Strange, ain't it? Do you ever notice how these fellows say, you're following a man, you're following a man, every man that says that, following a man. Isn't that peculiar? Listen, I'll tell you, if you can find a mistake in that book, you're not following me. Because I don't teach any mistakes in it. I'll tell you something else, you're not following the Lord. Amen. Anyone of you fellows here stand up at night, stand up and tell me that God Almighty, the Holy Spirit, showed you a mistake in that book, that God showed it to me. T you tell me. Tell me. I'll see you after service. We'll see whether you made the mistake or the Lord made the mistake. Every time you thought First John 5, 7 you shouldn't have been in, Isaiah's age, contradicting Chronicles and Kings, you got it out of another book, didn't you? Didn't you? Didn't you? Yes, you did. All right, Romans chapter 9, verse 17. For the scripture saith to Pharaoh, even for the same purpose have I raised thee up. The scripture foresees, the scripture raises people up. And Paul used the terms interchangeably. Revelation 22, 19. And if any man should take away from the W-O-R-D-S of the book of this prophecy, God should take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city. If any man should take away from the W-O-R-D-S, not the message, not the fundamentals, not the, not the truth. The W-O-R-D-S. Let's see if that's a good solid Bible doctrine. Let's turn to John, the Gospel of John. That's the best one for the deity of Christ. John chapter 5. John chapter 5. Somebody said, well, you couldn't have the words in the original because the words in the original are in Greek and you lose a lot in translation. You mean you lose a lot of the exact uh, force of the original? The fellow says, yes. 
Maybe the Lord doesn't want to have you have the exact force of the original. Maybe he wants to have you to have the exact force of the English. Do you ever think about that? I told a fellow one time, he said, if I had the originals right here in my pulpit tonight, I wouldn't teach them to you, and I mean it. If I was over in that room, the Lord, and angel of the Lord came down that room and said, here, uh, Brother Pete, here are the original manuscripts. And you know what I come over, what I teach you when I came over here tonight? Just what I got on the table. Oh, I says, ooh. You know why you say ooh? Because you're the idolater. You worship the paper the other things were written on. Yeah, that's it. And listen, a lot of this old superstitious reverence about the original, the original, original, is a cover-up for rejecting what God gave you. You better watch that stuff. All right, John chapter 5. John chapter 5, verse 47. John 5, 47. I'll begin at 46. For had ye believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if you believe not his writings, how should you believe my W? O R D S words. John chapter 3, verse 34. John chapter 3, verse 34. For he whom God has sent speaketh the W O R D S words of God. For God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. John chapter 14, verse 23. John chapter 14, verse 23. Now I realize this kind of dull to some of you. I'll tell you why it is. You don't have a proper estimation of the word. You don't have a proper estimation of the book. You're so soaked and shot through with time and life and look and Saturday evening post and Newsweek and the cane mutiny and gone with the wind. You don't know where you're at just about half the time. And God has put in your lap the greatest book this world has ever seen. And you underestimate it. You underestimate it. John chapter 14. Well, if all the dust was knocked off all the closed Bibles in Florida, there'd be a dust storm and smuggle across. <laughs> John chapter 14, verse 23. Jesus answered and said to me, watch it. If a man love me, he'll keep my W-O-R-G-S words. You say, I don't think it's that important. All right, let's see where you are. John chapter 8. Let's see if we can get your number. John chapter 8. John chapter 8, verse 47. Have you ever noticed how, how nervous this book makes people? Get out this book, they begin to shift and squirm around, you know, and get restless. You walk through an air terminal, one of these things, boy, and they'll look at you like you were a three-headed monster, man. <laughs> but I said, I know the Bible's the Word of God by how nervous it makes folks. You know, some of you fellows, when you, when you were about, oh, eight, nine, ten, eleven years old, you carried your Bible to public school. Then you got up around junior high and you quit it, didn't you? You know why you quit it? Too much pressure. You know why you have the pressure? Because you had the right book. And I'll tell you, if you carried a Life of Look magazine around there, nobody ever bothered you. A good news for modern man. But you carry on that old black back 66. And... See? All right, John chapter 8, verse 44. Ye are of your father the devil, and the less your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and both not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Which of you convince me of sin? If I say the truth, why do you not believe me? He that is of God, heareth God's W-O-R-D-S. You therefore hear them not, because you're not a God. Amen. <laughs> Now, you know something? Those verses say if you love the Lord, you're going to keep his words. And if his words aren't available, you don't have any proof you even love him. You reckon the God that inspired that book and gave it was so weak and so in, impotent and so uh, tired out he couldn't preserve it? You're any lost on the way someplace, just gave it up as a bad job? I tell you, if you had power to inspire, you must have power to preserve it. Amen. The very idea of God Almighty reaching over the bottoms of heaven and pulling me out of a dance band and out of a uh, bar room and where I used to hang out and saying, go preach the word, and then couldn't give it to me to preach. Brother, I got it. I got it. I got it. I know where it is. I know where it is. Some of that's a reference to the original. Of course, you get the authority for saying that. I read a book one time about how our Bible was inspired and every quotation the guy gave in it, he gave him a King James Bible. That's a weird thing. 
How do you figure that out? If you prove the original spire is this, how come you quote this? This isn't the original. Folks are funny. Somebody said you're a Bible believer. Yes. You say you're a Bible fanatic. Yes. That doesn't speak bad of me. That speaks bad of you. You ought to be too. Amen. You say, well, you put that book in too high a place. I don't put it put in a high enough place, and I'll show you. Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 5. Watch it carefully. Nehemiah 9, 5. Then the Levites, Jeshua and Kadmiel, Benai, Hashabaniah, Sherebiah, Hodijah, Shebaniah, and Pethahiah said to stand up and bless the Lord your God forever and ever. Watch it. And blessed be thy glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. Blessing here. Praise here. And his name exalted above all blessing and praise. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend, every head should bow, every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord of the glory of God the Father. Psalm 138. Psalm 138, verse 2. Psalm 138, 2. I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy small w word above all thy name. Now what you going to do with that? Now you got a whole generation of Christians that take that, just take that yawning. You don't think anything about it. And if you pray in the name of Jesus and talk about worshiping Jesus, and that book says he's magnified that word above his name, what do you know about that book? Well, have, you, have, you, have you stand up right now and give me four verses of marriage and divorce? Could you give them? Some of you have been through it. If I asked you to give me five verses on eating, could you give them to me? They're in there. If I asked you to give three verses on sports, could you find them? Some of you fellows are doing them. Oh, I say, man, if you didn't know the devil had this thing under control, you'd know it by that, wouldn't you? Here are a bunch of folks that are saved, profess to believe that book, and God already told you that book is above the name of his son. And what do you do with it? What do you know about it? Nothing. Nothing. Some of you folks have to stand up and on. I wouldn't embarrass you. If you have to stand up a night and give me five verses on making money and saving money, you could do it if your life depended upon it. And you know it. But you make money, you're in business. Turn to First Samuel. Now I'm going to show you something about you and the Lord and that word. Get First Samuel and pick up First Samuel chapter 3. First Samuel 3. And whenever you hear me say the word, you know what word I'm talking about? I'm talking about this one. And like I told you, if I had the original here, I wouldn't fool it. I wouldn't fool it. I teach Greek, teach Hebrew. I've got Kittle's Old Testament critical apparatus, Nestle's New Testament critical apparatus. I know about Tischendorf, Fergalish, Lockman, Grease Box, and all that stuff. And if I had that stuff right here in this table, I'd just give you this. This is the bread which the Lord thy God hath given me. All right, First Samuel 3. Wouldn't I be a fool to stand up here and preach that stuff? Imagine the fellow getting out in the street like I do in preaching. I preach out in the street in my hometown. And get up and top that bus and saying, And I want to tell you, in the market of ending, the circumflex accent is on the antifino. Glory to God. <laughs> All right, First Samuel 3, verse 1. And the child Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli. Watch it. And the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. Hard to get the word. Amos said there's going to be a famine someday. Watch it careful. Verse 7. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. How come? The word of the Lord was not yet revealed to him. Verse 19. And Samuel grew and the Lord was with him and he let none of his W-O-R-D-S fall to the ground. Verse 21. And the Lord appeared again in Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. And you know why some of you say people that are saved going home to heaven don't know the Lord like you should know him? Because you don't know that book like you ought to know that book. And I'll tell you something, when the Lord reveals himself to you, he revealed himself through there. The verse said he did. And when you... Like what old catechism said, ignorance of this book is ignorance of Christ. And I don't make them identical. So I've got better sense than that. But boy, they sure are close, aren't they? I mean, Christ had two natures, so does this. Christ can save you, so can this. Receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your soul. They're both living. 
They're both loved. They're both hated. They're both incorruptible. They sure are close, aren't they? 